Margaret, thank you for joining me today. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. You are quite welcome. I'm excited to talk to you because I think you, I think you've been on a journey that a lot of other people may have been on or are struggling through right now, trying to figure out what to do for themselves. So I think your story mm -hmm. can be really helpful for a lot of people. Um, but before we dive into that, or maybe a good transition into that, who are you? So I, at this point, I feel like I'm a jack of all trades. Not that that is a good thing. It, it, it's got <laughs> some benefits, but I feel like it also has some detriment. But I didn't know what I wanted to do or what I wanted to be. And I'm still, you know, fine tuning it like everyone does. So I thought pharmacy was for me. I got into pharmacy school, followed that path for most of the schooling experience and realized it was not for me. And I transferred into exercise science, so kinesiology, the study of movement, and fell in love with that. But as a result of having the experience in both backgrounds, I actually right now have been teaching biology, biology as well as physical education and environmental sciences, which has been its own unique adventure. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine teaching is a very unique adventure. Mm -hmm. The things that they say, or like, as I was telling you before we started recording, I'm, I was grading finals today. And not all of the students that I was grading were mine. So I didn't know them, maybe didn't know their handwriting. But some of the things that they either wrote or the typos that you interpret wrong, I'm like, this is really funny. <laughs> I feel like it's like keeping it anonymous for the students' sake. I'm like, I feel like there should be a website where all this random stuff is posted for people to get a good laugh when they need a pick-me-up. <laughs> yes, we were saying that. There was one that they forgot the... G and H in fight. And it almost looked like F I C K. And we were like, Ooh, they got a little creative with this response. Or I had one that I, it said flower and crops, but I read it wrong the first time. And <laughs> it was flowing crops. <laughs> but again, it's funny. You're like, did they really just write that? That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, what we, I really want to dive into is really kind of how you got to where you are with your nutrition side of things, your health coaching side of things. Um, because a lot of, kind of like a lot of us, a lot of our past histories brings us to what we do today. So mm -hmm. I would love for you to share some of your story of like what you dealt with and how you found those answers for yourself. Yeah, so I dealt with irritable bowel, or at least that's what it was diagnosed as ultimately for most of my life. Um, I was an infant, my parents recall in diapers, dealing with serious gastrointestinal bloating and they didn't know what to do with it. While maybe there's some more research now, because I have some friends with young children who've said like their doctors have told them to say cut out caffeine or this or that because of how their child's, you know, reacting to their, the breast milk. I don't think that was as readily known at that time. Um, so as, and I don't know if that was the case or not, but I, from a young child was always bloated, um, dealing with extreme gas pain, constipation or diarrhea. I tended to go one or the other way, um, at different times, as well as, as I got older and was in school, um, was experiencing a ton of brain fog specifically after meals, um, was probably the worst time I'd experienced it. So I slept through one year. My mom had a parent teacher conference with my French teacher and I loved French class. And she's like, she sleeps the entire time and does really well on her test, but she sleeps the entire time. And it was simply, it was after breakfast. And for me and what I was eating at breakfast, which I think was bagels, cause that's what everyone's told us healthy. Um, it caused me to have a glycemic spike and then fall back down. And in that falling back down, I fell asleep. Um, and so it was a lot of different factors and I pursued doctors. We asked doctors about it. Um, I pursued specialists like gastroenterologists and really most of it didn't come up with information. And while I don't like to say Dr. Google is the answer, I feel like Dr. Google has a lot of keys to at least get the ball rolling or get you thinking about things in a different way, whether it's the real thing, whether it's a hoax, whether some angry blogger decided to throw this thing up here and now you think it's fact. Um, I think it's a great way to look at things differently or be like, okay, what could this be? What could we explore? 
And even in my own health right now, I'm dealing with some of that. I currently have a crown on one of my teeth that when it was put on, I've had severe pain and can't chew on it since. Um, and I just haven't had the mental energy or time to really dig into what's going on. Because at that point, I was like, well, I can chew on the other side of my mouth till I go have time to go in and deal with it. Since then, a tooth on the other side has broken. And now I can't chew on either side. <laughs> um, and I'm now questioning, I'm going to get a second opinion from a different dentist simply because both teeth they had, pre they had previously filled, done fillings on. Um, and I'm like, is there a correlation? Was there a nutritional deficiency in like, say, vitamin D? And again, it's a lot of me Googling what could possible reasons be, but then taking it to a professional or taking it to other people who know more can have labs done to really maybe get me an answer. I don't know if there is an answer to this one, but I feel like there's too much of a pattern going on for it not to have an answer. <laughs> I would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you, you pointed out a great thing when it comes to Dr. Google, because, you know, we all, whether it's how to do a home repair or <laughs> something with our medical, it's like we go to the internet, which isn't a bad thing. It, it does help educate us, but then it is like trying to cipher through all the information, figure out what's mm -hmm. true, figure out what's not. And and yeah, having that information to help you think outside the box, think about other things that it might be rather than just doctors telling you, oh, there's nothing wrong, um, I think is, is a super, um, is an amazing benefit of the internet. Absolutely. So when you were dealing with all your IBS issues, um, you're falling asleep when in class, things like that. What did you start finding as the answers for like why this was all going on? I have yet to fully figure out answers to it. Actually, I've just found food triggers um, is simply where mine has been. I've worked with some really, really good doctors and we still haven't gotten concrete diagnoses or fig figured out specific things. And I think some of mine is very much stress related, which is why we maybe can't fully trace it. Um, because it's not going to show up on a lab other than maybe running cortisol on a daily basis or something. Um, I think some of mine is very much stress related or just activity related, sleep related, which are really hard to track beyond using a sleep tracker or something. But I mm -hmm. feel like that's not always fully consistent. So maybe it's multifactorial would be a good word. Um, but I really feel like some of the things that I had found, um, I remember when looking last year, year and a half ago or so I did a GI map test. So where they map the bacteria of your colon to the best of doctor's ability. Um, and we found, I don't remember the exact strains, but there were some strains of bacteria in there that the doctor was like, this is not normal, especially for someone who is healthy, who is active, who doesn't have X, Y, and Z conditions. These are not normal bacterial strains to be seeing in this capacity. Um, so definitely things like that could be an indicator for someone who's really trying to figure out health um, and finding a good doctor who can read those things reliably, but also knowing that there's a uh, pretty large percent error on bacterial gut tests as well. Um, and again, finding food sugar. So for me, I don't do well on if anything is high sugar, especially processed sugars, I just tend to stay away. Um, most grains I don't do well on. I can do some rice, some corn here and there, but I don't make it a staple at every meal. Um, it's like maybe a once a day occasional thing. We'll just back up your base. Um, it cut out as you were talking about your triggers. So let's kind of just restart with, um, like what your food triggers are. Yeah. So I feel like some of my triggers definitely can be stress related or maybe, uh, exacerbated by the presence of stress, but probably my biggest ones, I tend not to do a ton of processed sugar or sugars as a whole simply because I know that then I'll usually have a glucose spike and a crash. So if I'm doing that, I usually, I, I don't do it often, but if I am having any, I usually tend to either take a walk or exercise afterwards to kind of level it out. Uh, beyond that, I tend not to do too well with legumes, um, in large capacities. Again, occasionally I'll eat them here and there. Um, but not a ton or I tend to do better if they're like ground into like a flour. Um, I feel like it's more easily digested by me. Um, and I tend not to do a ton of grains, specifically no gluten, because that one tends to give me hives. 
Um, but I'll do a little bit of corn or rice occasionally, but maybe only one or two meals a day, but usually one max. Okay. Yeah. Now was this like finding those triggers, was it you keeping a food log? Was it you just kind of, was it, did you do an elimination thing for a while? How did you come like, how did you do the detective work to figure this all out? Yeah, I think it was more elimination style. It was not an official style of any kind to an extent. I simply, when I was, I knew that it was really hard for me to say, try to figure any of it out when I was living at home in high school or anything, because you're given what your parents are cooking and you're expected to eat it, at least in my mom's Italian mind. Um, If I don't eat it, I'm going to offend her. And even today, but now today she knows that things trigger, like cause the trigger. So she's not offended in that same way. But had I just started to try something without concrete evidence, she would have probably been pretty upset that I wasn't eating whatever she made. Um, So (laughs) when I went off to college, I knew that things like breads and bagels and stuff already did not suit me well. Like I had kind of found those patterns. Um, So I started there and I was like, okay, then I'm not going to eat those. And I eliminated those. And I think it was around that time that I don't, I don't remember the exact blog post or the exact blog, um, but I found a a paleo based blog and was like, oh, people don't eat all of these things. I'm like, heck, let's try it. Um, Because I was like, this sounds fine to me. I'm like, I don't really eat a ton of these things anyway, um, because I've noticed that they upset my stomach or I would, I was starting to notice those things as I was kind of watching. And so I kind of followed a paleo elimination style diet and I've kind of lived within that with some flexibility since then. Okay. Okay. Do you notice since eliminating those things and kind of finding them as your triggers that when you do eat them now, they don't trigger you as much or do they still give just as bad consequences? I feel like the majority of the time they don't trigger me as much. Um, I feel more of the trigger if I'm, you know, eating it for say multiple times. So like, I don't know, maybe someone had a party and I really, really love that cake that my aunt or whoever, whatever made. Um, so I'm deciding to have a piece or two over a couple of days. Then I usually do tend to maybe notice it if I've had it consecutively. Um, if it's a little piece or a taste, I don't notice as much of an issue. Um, but I also don't crave them as much. So I don't usually go for them. Um, Occasionally, I will notice big issues, but I think often that is compounded by, again, stress or lack of sleep or eating a few other things that I know don't suit me well Mm -hmm. in conjunction. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned stress a a few times and sleep both. And and I think it's part of our system that is often overlooked. Like, I think a lot of times you go to your GI doctor, they're going to run all these tests but they're not going to ask you how your sleep is, how your stress levels are and all of that. Um, and knowing like how much that impacts hormones, which impacts gut health, which impacts everything else. It plays such an integral role. And it's an area that's, I feel is really missed in a lot of things. Yes, definitely. Um, I, I do think they're very heavily missed. And I know I've always known that I had a huge connection between my gut and my stress levels, because I was the kid who, okay, I got a little anxious over this activity coming up in school. My stomach was going to be in knots. I was going to be in the bathroom, like all of the things were going to go down. Um, but I think sleep is one of those that it's harder to find, especially if you're, at least for me, when I was in college, it's not that I was one to be up late. I was probably the one earliest in bed, um, and getting the most sleep. But even when I'd have little periods where I wasn't getting as much sleep. I definitely started to notice it. And actually without having one of those periods of no sleep, I probably wouldn't have found out that I, at that point in time had mono. Um, cause I felt so poor and I just thought it was like, you know, being sick with the flu and mm-hmm. they ran weather tests and they're like, no, you have mono. And it's like, Oh, okay. Not that it really did <laughs> that much to like do anything different, but I'm like, okay, that explains why it's lasting a little longer than the average. <laughs> um, right. but I definitely notice that I tend to get sick when I don't sleep. Um, so I try to focus on getting enough sleep um, and keeping everything else in line so that I'm getting good sleep. And that's n- sometimes easier said than done. Both stress can get in the way, having activities to do, or even sometimes when your hormones are out of balance for whatever reason, your sleep is going to be poor. 
And so that can be really frustrating or just trying to get back into those rhythms can be really hard. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I definitely notice that myself, the older I get, like I go through those, like, I actually just got out of one recently of that, like two weeks of just not being able to sleep up all like half the night and all of a sudden then it just corrects itself. And I have no clue what I did to cause it or what I did to like make a return, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, or I know that, and I'm going to start working shortly with a practitioner or at least talking to her more and consulting with her on it. But I have some, um, like many, we have many women today have um, estrogen dominance or just an imbalance Mm -hmm. and results in those mood swings, the bad PMS symptoms. And for me, a really poor quality of sleep. Um, And so I'm usually on a supplement that helps with some of it. And it made a world of difference. But about a month ago, it stopped working. Um, (laughs) So, and I, I blame some of this on my gut because this is a pattern that it has where like something will work great for a couple months and then it'll stop or, and again, these are all things I've probably got to figure out with my gut, but I'm also not in a huge rush because it'll work its way out in time. Um, but simply, I know that I have this pattern with um, too much estrogen or my body not using it well. So when this stopped working, I then had to took myself off it, you know, give it a little time off and then go back to it but it had been about two, three weeks now that I'm like, my sleep quality is so poor. I'm like, why is this happening? I've been sleeping more. I've been getting like, you know, good sleep conditions, not on my phone. And I'm still feeling like crud in the morning. So I finally am like, nope, it's been like a month. I can try out the supplement again. But it's one of those processes that I think sometimes also when you don't realize that you have sleep poor quality, like poor sleep quality, you don't realize it till it gets fixed. Yeah, very true. And that's, and you know, I feel like that's with health too. Like you don't realize how bad like energy levels are or just things are until all of a sudden things are better. And like, holy crap, how did I live yeah. years feeling like that before? Yeah. Or even I feel like, and you maybe can relate to this, but after, you know, post-college, You have more responsibilities, but it maybe doesn't feel like you're supposed to have more responsibilities. And then as a result, you're either more tired or there's just more things influencing you as a whole that you're like, why did I, for me, I personally felt amazing the first two years of college or like year two and three, roughly between those times. And I'm like, how did I feel so good? What was I doing then? How can I get back to that? (laughs) Some of it was simply that I didn't have as many commitments on my plate. And some of it maybe was that I was in a more controlled environment. Um, and my, you know, schedule is super, super consistent. Like I was up at the same time every day going to the gym and things like that. But it's also one of those that I'm like, what was I doing? And sometimes it can be really hard to figure out, okay, what triggered that poor health outcome Mm -hmm. or, um, simply like, what was I doing at that point in time that made it feel so good? Or was that all in my head? (laughs) There's, yeah, it's, there's so many variables that play into it that like you, it is good to think back as far as what am I, what was I doing or what was I not doing or, you know, things like that. But then, you know, even just like 10 years difference in life can make hormonal changes happen or can make, you know, you, I, it's funny. I, I was talking with a friend about this recently. She's like, I feel like I can't remember anything. I have to write things down now. She's like in college. I was awesome. I was like in college, like that's what we had to focus on. We had that we had sports. Now we have like job and family and like yeah. all this other stuff. Like, so I think just as we get older, we just have so like, it's different things, but we just have like so many more things going on that impact everything else going on in our body and our head. Absolutely. Or I think I, I completely agree with that. Or I look at, I was, I think not, I've never been officially diagnosed, but I think I might have ADHD, but the ability to hyper-focus. Mm, yep. And so like, I was always super fast on tests and this and that and the other thing. And like, so like today when I'm grading these tests, I was like running through them really fast and everyone else was like a little slower. And I'm like, I wonder if it's that, but for, I find I now maybe because I'm not using it as often or things like that, I struggle to bring those qualities out mm, sometimes okay. where like, I feel like maybe in college they were a, a, pre- a higher, a more common practice for me. So then now it's not there and being used as often. And I don't know if that's a true thing or not, but I feel like sometimes some of the practice isn't there. Yeah. Which is very possible. I mean, anything, if you don't do it consistently, you kind of like, it comes back pretty fast, but you do learn, lose a little bit of that, like 
speed on it initially. So, um, have a question. What did going back a little bit to earlier in the conversation, we were talking about the, the G mapping and the bacteria that were found when they found the ones that weren't supposed to be there, or at least in that, that, um, concentration there, what was, what were the steps taken in order to start addressing the bacterial growth? Yeah. So a lot of it was supplementation. So I used a handful of supplements that the doctor had prescribed. Um, they were medical grade supplements. I don't remember the exact, um, ones. I know one had a heavy magnesium content, um, which I think I was also deficient in anyway. Um, one is just to help and some were probiotics, things like that, but really ones to promote good growth and get rid of the bad as well as I was following a more strict, um, diet plan for her, but that was also more that I think due to the fact that I had some candida overgrowth as well. Mm. That was more diet itself was more for that, but starve out the bad, feed the good. Mm -hmm. And that was really the protocol I followed. Okay. Awesome. Did you do a another GI map test afterwards to kind of see how that all balanced out? I did not. And I probably should have, but I also had some other health issues that came up right as all of it was finishing that kind of resulted in just all of that being thrown to the wayside. So those other health issues could be dealt with. Yeah. Um, and those I think are finally at like, it's been a year, but some of it I think took a really long time for it to iron out. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I understand. Well, I was just curious on that. I, I should probably take one again for sure. But. <laughs> so if someone is looking at Dr. Google, like based on your experience, what you've done um, throughout um, your life, if someone's looking at Dr. Google, they have like all this information, they aren't sure how to sort through it. Like where, where do they start kind of deciphering? Like, what do I, what do I do? What do I not do? What do I bring up to my doctor? What is quackery? Yeah, I think it can be really hard because I also look at how many doctors will call things that I tr feel are truly reputable information quackery because it's yeah. not an conventional model. Um, it's in a more alternative model or it's new science or it's nutritional science, which traditional medical doctors don't really get a ton of training in. Yeah. Things like that, which I completely get. They only have so much time to learn things. But um, I feel like looking at okay, if you're going on a blog, who wrote that blog? Are they a health coach? Are they a personal trainer? Does that qualify them to give you excellent advice? Or do they have a master's in nutrition? Do they, you know, just have a certification? And I'm not saying that all certifications are bad, but being aware of the different levels that someone can have. Um, and some of it, I think, is also what do you agree with or I truly don't believe that most people should be on a plant-based diet unless they can do it smartly. And I think that being able to do that smartly, one, still doesn't always work for everyone. And two, you, you need the education to be able to do that. Um, like I have a, or had a professor who strongly for himself believes in a plant-based diet, but he has a doctorate in nutrition and can tell him, you know, knows where to find the proteins and resources and supplements that he needs to be able to, you know, survive and thrive on that diet. Um, where most people will be like, okay, I'm plant-based and just avoid all meat, which is obviously what it comes down to, but, um, don't ensure that they're getting adequate, um, protein levels of essential proteins that our body doesn't produce or essential vitamins that you can only get through animal sources or can't be absorbed without fat sources or things like that. Um, and it just takes a little bit more work that I think people don't think about because it's at least right now, very popular to be plant-based, mm -hmm. I feel. Yeah. You brought a up a lot of good points there and it's I have nothing against being plant-based, but like you said, you have to know what you're doing with it because there are so many things you be can become deficient in if you don't know what you're doing and you're just eliminating meat. Um, and, and I think too, it's like any way of eating, there's, everybody's going to respond a little bit differently and everyone, everything's going to be a little bit different for, but, but yeah, having that understanding and and education and, or at least talking to someone who knows that stuff to do it properly and make sure you're getting all the nutrients is key. Yeah. And again, I'm not completely opposed. I, I have very 
torn views, not about being plant-based fully, but like I follow or read books by someone who's like uh, Dr. Paul Saladino, who's very much on the carnivore side of eating. But I also really enjoy, um, I've been reading one of Dr. Wills Cole's books and he actually does a keto, a plant-based keto approach. And so obviously very different sides of the spectrum. And I think there's validity to all of it, but it's again, understanding, okay, they have the education or what can they bring to the table or what can I use that I can apply to my life? but also make sure that I'm getting what I need. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Have you, I'm reading it right now and it's so fascinating. Have you read Metabolical? I have not. It is fascinating. It's um, Robert Lustig um, basically breaking down. What was that? His stuff's great. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, So he really dives into the, the like where, I think he dives into the more of like how agriculture affects like the planet eventually. But right now it's all like the medical side of things and like all this stuff, like why the doctors don't address a lot of things. And mm-hmm. it's fascinating. So highly recommend if you are looking for another book to read. Oh, I will definitely add it to my list right now. I've been reading books to screen for uh, reading, having my students read. So they kept asking me tons of questions about Charles Darwin. And I'm like, I have no answers for you. I'm like, here's, <laughs> Of what he did in life he's British that's you know like he went on a you know multi-year journey around the world on a ship um so now I've been like screening little books on that or just like other topics and it's been really fun to like be like why didn't I ever read this because this is just so cool but um no there's definitely so many great books like that out there um another one if you really like like the behind the scenes of like at least the American healthcare system and why everything is maybe different or crazy or maybe why you should question it more um, primal prescription. I don't remember the authors, but it's very information heavy, but it's basically their belief system on why certain pieces of the U S health system aren't great, but not necessarily why they should say be socialized medicine either, but like, here's where their shortcomings are. Yeah. Cool. I'll add that to my list. Awesome. Um, Well, tell us a little bit um, just about, I know you have your business. It was kind of put on hold to deal with some stuff, but you're kind of ramping it back up again. Tell us just so listeners kind of know like what the, what's out there. Um, Tell us a little bit about kind of what you do. Yeah. So really right now where my focus has been is I've been starting to get back into running my own podcast, the Grapes and Gains radio show, or I think I'm going to rebrand to just Grapes and Gains radio, make it short um, and sweet. Um, where I actually focus on both health, wellness, fitness, but also wine, because that is another hobby of mine, um, is working vineyards and learning more and things like that. And while they don't always go hand in hand in life, because I have periods where I cannot drink wine because my stomach is saying no, I feel like my health journey wouldn't be where it is today without wine, without just the environment, but also learning to relax a little bit because at some points in my life, I've been so strict on myself on what I can and can't eat because of fear. Um, that actually it was when I started drinking wine and working at a winery that I kind of relaxed a little bit, um, and saw improvements from that as well. Um, but also I'm in the process of publishing a book, which I'm hoping that will be out by the end of December if not earlier. Um, It's going through some editing and uh, feedback phases right now. Um, It's called F the Freshman 15 because I strongly believe that that pattern that is created and results in weight gain, but also poor health that likely leads to chronic disease later shouldn't exist. Um, Or at least should people should be more aware of the Mm -hmm. actions they're taking. Um, And then I'm also doing some running coaching on the side um, from a holistic and nutrition based standpoint. Awesome. So cool. And I love that book idea. Cause I would agree with that. Like that does not need to happen. It happens way too frequently. And yeah. yes. I, I, so I was the one who went the opposite direction. Probably I, I lost weight during college right now. I'm probably the same weight I was pre-college, but I'm more muscle than I, you know, my body composition has changed. So I don't care as much, but at that point I was, I was very overweight going into college and lost weight. Okay. Um, within college. Cause I was just like, I can't live this way anymore. Um, but recently seeing a bunch of peers graduate college who I started school with, I'm like, not that I'm judging them in any way, but I'm like, Oh, they've gained some weight or they don't look as healthy or they look like they really need a nap. Um, 
<laughs> just, you need some quality sleep and some food and maybe some sunshine and you look way better. <laughs> I don't mean to need cry, but I'm like, I feel for you because I know where you've been. And this is not like, you probably don't realize that you feel achy, but you probably do feel achy. <laughs> oh my gosh that's awesome and so true <laughs> you know with the uh, you just mentioning as far as losing weight when you went in like once you started eliminating all those foods that weren't working for you I mean it naturally took a lot of that inflammation out of your body and allowed you to lose weight too it did definitely I and I probably went a little over the top but I think I dropped 40 pounds in four months again a lot of it being inflammation um some being fat. And then also the fact that I'm like, oh, I'm losing weight. And then I started playing the scales game and very quickly realized that that is a slippery slope and got myself to stop. But you're one of those where it's like, oh, I've never weighed this little. How far can I go? And then you're like, wait a minute. This is, <laughs> this is not okay. <laughs> and then I stopped. But I was like, but, it, but it's one of those where I, with my IBS as a child, struggled to lose weight. I was always the heavy kid. Never could seem to lose weight. My parents took me to a nutritionist at some point in time trying to get me to lose weight as a child. Things like that that I was like, wait, I'm actually losing weight now. Where this couldn't, this was never my reality. I was always the heavy one. Yeah. Um, that it then became very problematic, but. Well, at least you pulled yourself out of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. But I think everyone, at least I feel like everyone in the health world has maybe almost dabbled in that because it can be very powerful to run faster or lose more weight or lift heavier. And then you have to realize, okay, is this still good for my health at this yeah, point in time? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think too, um, I mean, I definitely, it wasn't on purpose, but I got myself down um, to 9% body fat and like mm -hmm. absolutely loved the way I looked, but then I could tell where I keep myself now, which is closer to like 13 to 15% range. Um, I perform a lot better. So I just do better in the gym. I do better with my running and my racing and my competition. So, um, like there, it's definitely like, it's awesome to have that low body fat and look amazing, but especially if you're in the sports world, you also have to start looking at like, where's my performance suffering? Like at what, and what point is the best way? Like what's my ideal for my body to perform well? Exactly. Or I'm honestly, pro so I feel probably my best between 18 and 20. I'm a little above that right now. It's not as desired, but I've had way too much going on to fully <laughs> dive into it. Um, but again, point being, everyone's going to fit at a different spot. Or it could truly be like maybe, I don't know what you use to read your body for fat, fat percentages, but there's also going to be error within yes. reading. So like mine at 18 could be using just that method. It's going to read that way, but it could be slightly different. And that's very true too. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Well, hey, is there, before we close out, is there anything um, kind of you've gone through in your life that you feel is really important to bring up to the listeners that we haven't talked about yet today? Um, I really think just anything that you are feeling um, or dealing with is valid and obviously be aware of it. Cause at, and I mean that in the sense of, okay, looking at it, be like, okay, maybe I feel this way, but is it also in my head or my hormones impacting my thoughts? And not taking that as like, that's not a valid feeling, but being aware of those things too. Because Kurt, um, when I dealt with those health issues last year, um, I obviously had a lot of things going on, but it also completely disrupted my female hormonal mm -hmm. cycle. Um, so at certain points in the month, everything was lovely. Everything was happy. I loved everyone. And then at about the other half of the month, I hated everyone. And again, it was one of those that the rose colored glasses were there or they were not. And everything was being affected by those viewpoints. And again, I think that's valid, but also being aware, okay, is that being affected by something else in my system? Mm -hmm. Or is that truly how I am? And part of that was obviously the hormones were completely out of whack. <laughs> um, but I think still ha those feelings are validated, even if they are being caused by something like that is something important to have and be aware of. Yeah. Awesome. What's really cool is you finishing on that. And then the next one I record. So the next one release is going to be on hormones. I'm talking to someone Ooh. who's like specialized in hormones. So they'll be awesome. a good, like continuing conversation. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Margaret, this has been a great conversation. Um, if someone wants to um, 
has any other questions for you, just wants to talk to you, um, or even like once your book is released, wants to get your book, like where is that going to be able to be found? Yeah, that'll be found Amazon as well as I'm planning to get it into bookstores and other places as well. Um, I just have to look a little bit at how distribution works. Um, cause I was working with a publisher and now I'm not, and I don't know if I will continue to work with them or not at this point. Um, I liked their system, but it was not perfect and not perfect for how my I wanted to promote my book. Um, so it'll be in bookstores. It'll be on Amazon. So it'll be in a bunch of places. And if you want to keep up to date on that, actually just have them directly send me an email to Margaret at grapesandgains.com. And I add them to an email list for that. Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This was a really good uh, conversation. I think a lot of people will get some good um, benefit from it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome.